Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Fantasy Romance and Romantic Fantasy. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. So good. Ah, oh, slurp that puppy down. Uh, today is Tuesday, November 30th, final day of November. One more month, 2021 to go. Kind of amazing, isn't it? And <laughs> I don't know what I have to say today. Let's see. So um, yesterday, you know, was reentry after having the the week off. Um, I'm sure a lot of you feel me, at least in the U.S., where we had our Thanksgiving week. Reentry can uh, burn a bit, right? Yeah. Um, so I did write yesterday. Um, I wrote on Grey Magic. And I got like 2,000 words, a little over 2,000 words, which is not my goal. I usually write two to 3,000 words a day. Those, some of you may know that. Um, I got 2285, actually. It's slightly better than. Uh, so I wasn't far off of. Um, getting there when I am ramping up again from being off I try to cut myself a little bit of slack and uh, so, you know sort of like um, after Thanksgiving week I'm not going to go out and run my usual amount maybe some of you do all praise to you um, I am a ramp up kind of gal and so yeah <laughs> So I did three hours worth of work and I got to the 2285s. And so I called it a win. Um, I'm still working my way back into this book, getting my head into it. So, so yeah, I'm getting it all figured out. Um, reminder to those of you who may have been looking for Fire of the Frost coming out on Thursday. It has been moved back 20 days to December 22nd. Had to be done. Um, three of us were ready. One of us was not. Sometimes those things happen. And uh, tribe publishing, there's a lot of buffer for that. Although those dates get moved back sometimes too. But, you know, it's funny because we put deadlines on this thing that's the creative process. And um, sometimes it just doesn't always work out that way. Uh, yeah, for some reason I'm tired today. I think like yesterday I had plenty of energy because I, you know, we got back Saturday um, from driving to Tucson. And so Saturday was a long driving day, but then Saturday night I slept like a rock. Sunday I did stuff like laundry and things, but it was a pretty good rest day. Kind of. I crunched a bunch of royalties and felt myself getting tired then. The other half of being a self-publisher and like being the one in charge of the anthologies and stuff. I keep thinking I should really give myself a percentage uh, for crunching all of that, but I don't. I should maybe bring it up to my, uh, to my fellows about it, like keeping back like a, just like 5% or something like that. Cause um, yeah, it takes a fair amount of time to go through all of those numbers. The thing is, is, part of the reason I haven't charged for it is because it's something I do anyway. I crunch all of my royalty numbers all the time, even on my trad stuff, as much as I'm able to. Um, Kensington seems to have taken the pandemic as license to not send us detailed royalty statements. Um, I, I don't know, because they're assholes. That's, I, I don't know what their deal is. They're like, oh, well, we haven't been in the office because of the pandemic. It's like, okay, so why, why can't you send us our royalty statements like you are legally obligated to do? So, but everybody should, you know, just, um, it's common wisdom for those getting traditionally published uh, or 
maybe it's not common wisdom, but it's standard advice that you should always, always read your contracts, right? Even if you get your agent to vet it for you. Uh, and a corollary to that is, is you should read your royalty statements. So for example, um, I got a summary from my previous agency on my 12 kingdoms and uncharted realms books, my, uh, every six month payout from Kensington on those. And she had like totaled up the amounts. So when I say I don't get the detailed statements, I can't see how many copies that, um, correlates to, I would really love to get those numbers again, but, uh, she had like broken out per book. Cause there's five books in that group from Kensington and she, you know, had the lump numbers for that, gave me the grand total and then less the 15%, right? With standard agency cut. So I'm putting the numbers into my spreadsheets and I noticed that she left out one of the books that her total, uh, was less an amount that was exactly for one of the books. And so I emailed her back and said, um, I caught this discrepancy and is this what happened? And she said, yes, that's exactly what happened. And she said, you know, I really do appreciate that you checked me because, uh, I don't think she's does it on purpose. In fact, I'm sure she doesn't do it on purpose because she's very, um, honest person, but you know, every once in a while people miss things and, you know, as you guys may or may not know, my corporate career uh, in environmental consulting heavily involved data auditing. So I am like, I am the queen of QA. It's like I have checks and cross checks. So it's good. I mean, it's, it's good that I checked that because I mean, it wasn't a massive amount of money, but it was like $500. Um, no, it makes a difference. So, um, uh, my back's also a little stiff. I really need to do some catch up yoga and I haven't totally gotten off my yoga schedule, which is bad and terrible and wrong. Alas, alas for that. I really need to find a way to work it into my schedule so that I'll do it. Still throws me off that I can't go to yoga class that my favorite yoga teacher has not gone back to in person yet. Maybe I should go to a different yoga teacher. We don't really love that idea, do we? <clears throat> so today is a rambly day, clearly. And I'm like fidgeting with stuff on my desk. It's a paper clip, rubber bands. That's what I'm toying with. <laughs> Various other items on my desk that I fiddle with. My favorite fiddle thing I don't see. I don't know where it went. So anyway. Um, so yeah. Ramping back up into writing, ramping back up into schedule, kind of figuring out the getting the Christmas things done. I do have sparkly gold nails for Christmas. Pretty exciting. David and I were having a conversation in the car on the Thanksgiving drive. We were listening to 21 Pilots, uh, the song Stressed Out. And David made the comment that he said, I bet these guys knew that that song was going to be a major hit as soon as they wrote it. And I said, oh, I don't think so. And he said, yeah, he said, bands know these things. And I'm tempted to Google. Shall I? Let's pause and I'm going to Google. Well, I didn't want to go too much down to that rabbit hole. Um, I did not find an easy answer, but anyway, so, you know, David was saying, well, that bands know when a song is, is good and when it's going to be a hit. And I, <laughs> I was like, did they though? <laughs> Dorinda laughs at me because she will, she will tell me things like, um, oh, I don't know, whatever, uh, you know, she'll say, you know, this, this thing is true, or this person said that this thing is true. And I'll be like, is it though? Uh, to the point where this is like, I don't know, we'd, it'd be like our personal hashtag. Is it though? Um, you know, she says that I question everything, which is good, 
counterpoint to her questioning nothing. Sorry, Dorinda. Actually, Dorinda's like massively under deadline, so she's not going to be watching this, or she better not be watching this. Um, but yes, I do question everything. I, when I was in college, I learned, I took several classes that strongly encouraged critical thinking. In fact, I think I learned that in college more than anything else. Um, and examining the uh, broad generalizations and sweeping statements is like part of my specialty. So, so when somebody says something like that, you know, like, oh, well, people know, bands know when something's good. My immediate response, regardless of what they've said, is to say, is it though? Is that, is it true? And it's not even that I'm certain that it's not true. It's like, let's, let's examine this. And you guys know that this is something I think about a whole lot is like, what makes something successful? Why are some things phenoms? Uh, and, and there's levels to this, right? You know, you have a song like Stressed Out, which became a massive hit. Um, but is it necessarily better than other songs of theirs that, you know, didn't quite le reach that level of airplay, right? Um, when we talk about books, uh, you know, there is the, the phenoms like Harry Potter, right? Twilight, so, or Fifty Shades of Grey's, these things that hit a, a level of, I won't, it's almost like godhood within, within the art, right? It's not this, that they're just popular, it's that they um, become cultural icons. And it doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with whether or not they're good. I'm not saying that they're not good, but it's something else that's happened. Um, you know, and Harry Potter, uh, J.K. Rowling's problematic changes since aside, um, or maybe not changes, but positions, ideas, opinions, uh, you know, she very famously could not sell that book for a very long time. Nobody would take it. And the publisher who finally bought it, bought it because his kids had picked up the manuscript and started reading it and loved it. And her agent said to her at the time, I hope you're going to be happy being poor because children's books never make any money. Um, you know, so we love these stories, but we love them in part because it's, it confirms our survivorship bias because we love the story of the underdog that achieves regardless, right? Um, first of all, we love success. We love success. We love success, particularly if it comes from an underdog place. The problem with survivorship bias is that we look at that story and we tell this story, but we are not telling the story of the 99%, 99.9% of other books that are children's books that never made any money. Um, that never made it to press, <clears throat> that nobody ever bought. Um, you know, that's the thing about the phenom is we look at that and we want to replicate that success. But the, the overall, <laughs> but most things are not that successful, but we don't tell those stories because they're not interesting, right? You know, we're not going to tell the story of, oh yeah, here is this, book that went to a hundred publishers and a hundred publishers said no, and it was never published. The end. It's a boring story, right? Or the, um, this book went to 99 publishers and the one publisher took a chance on it and it sold 1500 copies and you, it's out of print now. And if you're lucky, you might find it, um, in a backwater library somewhere, but otherwise it disappeared. Not very interesting story either, right? But those are the preponderance of the stories. We love the, we love the success stories. That's the survivorship bias, and it's it's part of human nature, right? We are geared to look for success. We are look geared to look for the thing that will enable us to survive, that will enable us to flourish. So we don't 
we don't care about the failure stories so much, except to extract a lesson, uh, which is an unfortunate thing. But, you know, like when, um, like somebody gets sick, uh, a lot of times people will say, well, what did they do? What did they do to get sick? Or, and this is where a lot of the rape narratives come from. You know, somebody is, is attacked and raped and people say, well, what was, what was, what were they doing? What was she wearing? Was she drinking? And, and we talk about how this is a major problem because it's victim shaming, right? But this comes from a fundamental human psychological tool that we have to build a narrative to enable us to help avoid danger. So it's like, oh, okay. So if she was doing X, Y, and Z, then I need to avoid doing X, Y, and Z so that I can survive and flourish. Um, these are like the animal parts of our nature and our brains that we have to overcome, right? Uh, which isn't always easy. So, so when we look at something like 21 pilots stressed out and David saying, well, they knew that this would be a success when they wrote it. And he said, bands are always know these things. And it's like, well, do they, or do we, do we retcon it? Do we create the narrative in reverse? So one thing that I noticed from my days of writing memoir is you would construct this narrative. Like, let's say, um, you, you do something like you're writing a story about how you found out that you have pancreatic cancer or something. And you say, um, if you're writing an essay about it, you would use a device, something like, I remember the day I first felt the pain, you know, and you construct that story of like walking up to the mailbox and feeling that strange pain and thinking, Oh, what is that? And, and then you tell the story of discovering the diagnosis and so forth. But the thing is, is like how many times all of those, all of those days that you go out and walk out to the mailbox and feel a weird pain in your side that, it, and it's not pancreatic cancer. Well, it's a non-story, right? So what we do when something turns out to be a significant event is we go back and we reconstruct the narrative, sort of like going back and and highlighting points, you know, like if you imagine like the broad stream of data and we highlight those points and pick out the storyline, the narrative that led to this event. Well, if this event didn't occur, then there, those would just be random points, right? So do we know? if something's going to be successful? Do we know something's going to be good? It, it's something that he certainly believes um, and has brought it up a number of times. I don't think I do believe it. Um, I don't know when something I've done is better than something else I've done. It's, it's not clear to me the way that um, it seems to be clear to other people. It just isn't, you know, and I know I've referenced this often and I no longer link to it because JK Rowling's problematic now. Uh, but you know, there was this amazing interview between Oprah and JK Rowling where Oprah asked Rowling if she had any idea that her books would become such a phenomenon. And she said, no. And she said, did you have any idea that your talk show would become such a phenomenon? And Oprah said, no. And then they talked about, if you were asked to replicate this, could you do it? And neither one of them could because they didn't know what they had done in the first place. So food for thought. On that note, I will remind you all that first cup of coffee is part of the Frolic Media Podcast Network, and you will find more podcasts that you love at frolic.media slash podcasts. And I will talk to you all on Thursday. Take care. Bye-bye.